Hey guys, it's Andre from High Performance Academy. Welcome along to another webinar. This time we're going to be delving into some of the secrets behind tuning a world record level drag car. Now this is one of my own personal passions. Uh, basically from the start of my career uh, I've been heavily involved in import drag racing. Although these days being located in Queenstown in the South Island of New Zealand and probably somewhere around about 1500 kilometres away from uh, our best drag strip here in New Zealand. Uh, I've taken more of a back seat to drag racing but that hasn't dampened my enthusiasm for it. One of the reasons that I am so passionate about import drag racing or drag racing in general I should say is that when it comes to testing uh, the output from an engine there really is no better place. I think probably everyone's heard or seen of, seen of a dyno sheet somewhere on the internet that seems possibly a little bit too good to be true and we're all probably aware that it is relatively easy in some instances to uh, end up getting unrealistic results from a dyno. Some people do this on purpose, sometimes uh, we can just see dyno sheets from certain dyno manufacturers that just tend to read a little bit higher and skew the sort of results we're seeing. When it comes to the drag strip though there is no way to fake those results and at the end of the day if you know what you're looking at the mile an hour in particular is going to tell you a huge amount about the performance of your engine. So for me primarily as an engine builder and an engine tuner I found the quarter mile was really the absolute test for uh, the engines that I built and tuned. Uh, now a lot of you probably are already aware of our background uh, what we did before we started or founded High Performance Academy but for those who aren't I just want to give you a really quick history lesson I guess and uh, for about 13 years prior to founding High Performance Academy I owned and ran, ran a workshop here in New Zealand it was called Speed Tech Motorsport or STM for short. So I'll just take you through a couple of the projects that we are probably most proud of I guess so let's head across to my laptop screen. Uh, the car on the screen at the moment is my old shop car so this is a Mitsubishi Lancer Evo 3. Uh, for those in the US market they were never delivered over there but relatively common in Japan, uh, New Zealand and even Australia. Uh, so this was the final iteration of the car as we're looking at it here. At the point uh, we finished with that car it held the world record as the fastest Mitsubishi Evo four wheel drive. It went as quick as an 8.23 at 180 mile an hour. Uh, was making around about 11 100, maybe a maybe a thousand and fifty wheel horsepower at that point, uh, running about fifty four psi of boost on methanol fuel, ref to ten and a half thousand rpm. Uh, actually, after we retired it, or the, after the last time it ran on the drag strip, we did wind the power up a little further, and the ultimate incarnation it was making just under twelve hundred wheel horsepower. So, still a number I'm incredibly proud of. Uh, we'll also head over and have a look at another car that you're going to see some data from shortly. Uh, this is an Evo 9 that we built for a customer so after we retired our shop car uh, we jumped into this project it was affectionately known as Project DS9 uh, it was an Evo 9 it used a 2.2 litre stroked 4G63 uh, produced 1001 wheel horsepower our focus with this particular car wasn't really about power we were focusing more on making sure every horsepower that we produced could be put to the track. The aim with this car was to beat what was then the late model Evo four wheel drive world record that was held by AMS Performance in the United States and so that we could compete on an even playing field with those guys we we specifically chose to run uh, a petroleum based fuel so this actually ran on VP Racing Q16. Anyway long story short at the time we retired that car it had done exactly what we intended it had gone as fast is an 8.34 at 169.7 mile an hour. So as I say we'll have a look at some data from uh, that car shortly and I'll just give you another quick tour through some uh, STM history files. Uh, these have just been thrown together, they're a little bit out of order but probably just give you again a little bit more insight into where exactly uh, I'm coming from in my experience to talk to you about uh, drag racing tuning. So again another shot obviously of my old drag car. Uh, this car that is in the background here actually was uh, my old street car 
and it's uh, pretty hard to see there. It's a DX Corolla, uh, and this was powered in the end by a Turbo 4 AGE with a silver top 20 valve head. Made 500 wheel horsepower out of what was basically a stock engine, and uh, that actually went uh, 10.5, I think it was, at about 134 mile an hour on the quarter. Uh, this is a shot of what we're trying to avoid, so we're going to be talking a lot today about power management or torque management so that we don't end up uh, with a car leaving the line and pointing at the other lane or we're still pointing at the wall. So uh, that's the Evo 9 Project DS9 that we're going to be looking at the data from. Another shot of this leaving the line just a little bit straighter this time. Uh, this is another car that I worked on for a customer and good friend of mine, Simon Steffick. This was a Mitsubishi Mirage that was converted to four-wheel drive and 4G63 power. Uh, for those who are eagle-eyed, you may be able to spot the fact that there is no intercooler on this car, uh, but we can actually see here on the charge pipe from the turbo to the inlet manifold, uh, there are actually a couple of 1600cc injectors there. Uh, so this ran on methanol fuel and is, is quite a common technique when running on methanol. Intercoolers aren't essential and uh, we're using a spray of methanol there just to cool that inlet charge. Uh, this is another shot of Simon's car there in competition at Mary Mary Drag, oh sorry, at Mastered and Dragway. Another shot of my old car and here is another one we built this time at WRX just to show that we weren't really focused solely on the 4G63, probably best known for the 4G63 but uh, have dabbled in just about anything and everything. Uh, so again a shot of what we're trying to avoid, massive wheel spin off the line, it's not going to help your 60 foot time and that's really one of the keys to a good quarter mile time, you really need to get the car to hook up well straight off the start line. Um, right, and I'm going to come back to this one actually, so we'll, we'll leave it for the moment. Uh, we'll, we'll come back and talk about this particular photo a little bit further into our, our discussion. All right, so with the kind of quick history lesson out of the way, out of the way there, we'll, we'll jump into what we're trying to do when we are tuning a high-powered drag car and talk about some of the tricks that I employed. Uh, None of them are particularly special, uh, but of course to those who are new to tuning drag cars, some of them may seem a little bit unusual. And really when it comes to tuning for drag racing purposes, uh, there are a couple of aspects we're trying to focus on. Uh, one of them is making sure that we get the best possible performance out of the car. So uh, we're looking at optimizing the amount of power that we can put to the track. But another aspect that is every bit as important is making sure that the engine is going to remain reliable. So what we're talking about here is some strategies that we can employ for engine protection. And uh, there are a few ways we can do this. We can monitor various aspects on the engine and we can use these to bring up driver displays. So particularly if you've got a dash or dash logger fitted to the car, uh, this is quite a common technique. What we'll do is monitor something such as maybe uh, our exhaust gas temperature and then if that gets outside of bounds then we're going to be able to bring up a warning on the dash to indicate to the driver something isn't right. Uh, it's incredibly important as well to understand that when we've got a car that's running faster than maybe a, a nine second quarter or, or thereabouts, there's a lot going on in a very short amount of time and really the ability for the driver to monitor a variety of gauges and decide if something isn't quite doing what it should be doing is all but impossible. Really the only thing the driver is going to be focusing on is a shift light and making sure that the car stays on the track. So what we want to do is basically give the driver as little information as they need and the trick here with some of these dash loggers is that we can indicate a driver warning. Often this is done through either an external light or even through the shift light module and this brings the driver's attention to the fact that something's gone outside of bounds and then they can shift their attention to the dash, take notice of that display and then decide what to do with that information. Now 
That all sounds great in theory, but I'm going to give you two uh, sort of scenarios where you may actually think maybe it's not the best way of doing it. So one was for a customer of mine, we'll actually be going to look at some data from this car shortly. It was a R32 Nissan GTR that at one point held the world record for the fastest four-wheel drive outright. Uh, I think it ran as quick as 741, by, well it's actually still around, it's coming back to the drag strip shortly, uh, we would hope. Uh, so this was running an RB26 engine and uh, the time I was involved with it was producing somewhere around about 14 to 1500 wheel horsepower. Um, again times have moved on, cars are much faster but at the time uh, this was obviously the fastest and that's still a huge chunk of power for an RB26. Now. As we can expect to see from time to time, this engine did suffer a mechanical failure at the drag strip at one point. And uh, we were running at a drag strip, it had been running at that point uh, high, mid, mid to high sevens at about 185, 188 mile an hour. And uh, it went and did a couple of runs and the final run I watched it do, it uh, ran a 7.8 but it was only at about 150 mile an hour. So again for a tuner or someone familiar with drag racing, when you see a drop off a mile an hour like that, that that's instantly quite alarming. Generally that means something's gone wrong with the drivers had to get out of the throttle. So the car came back to the pits and actually everything looked fine but uh, it turned out that it had actually had a mechanical failure and it had thrown a connecting rod out the side of the block. Now I straight away went through and had a look at some data from that and found out that around about the 1000 foot mark uh, the oil pressure had dropped to essentially zero. The reason for that was that the conrod had cut straight through the main oil gallery. Despite that, in the data, the driver had actually stayed at full throttle for the rest of the run. So I quizzed the driver about it because I know that I had set up a warning on the dash uh, to bring on the warning light and, uh, and indicate to the driver that the oil pressure had dropped. I asked the driver, he said, oh yeah, I saw the shift light come on, the warning light come on, I should say, but the car was still going, I was beating the guy in the other lane, so I stayed flat. So that's the sort of mentality that you are facing with a lot of drag races, even though there might be some pretty expensive machinery on the line, that desire to win is really critical. And my second example actually comes from my own experience, so I've got no one to blame here but myself. Uh, about the last time we actually raced my old Evo, uh, I'd had a problem with the boost control system. I'll try and keep a long story short here, what I'd done is reverted to using our MoTeC to control boost. In the midst of doing that, I had overlooked the fact that there had been an update, a major update in the MoTeC software and essentially what I'd done is gone out for my next run commanding what I thought was minimal boost. The reality was it was actually commanding almost maximum boost. So I left the line and everything felt really good, pulled second gear and the car was uh, really hooking up well and at that time the warning light came on for high EGT. And of course I chose to stay in it because the car was going well and uh, within about a split second the windscreen was covered in water it had lifted the head and torched a massive hole out between the cylinder head and the block. So uh, yeah, the whole point of this d discussion is basically if you are going to be using passive driver displays just understand that they may not be overly effective. My own personal preference moving on from what I've learned is that I now employ these safety strategies uh, as a car tour, some safety strategy in the ECU to automatically implement what whatever I'm trying to do. For example, if the EGT goes too high, uh, then I'll bring in a lower rev limiter to protect the engine, something of that nature. Exactly the same with our oil pressure warnings. So I just want to talk about what parameters I think are really important to be monitoring there. And of course you can monitor just about everything under the sun, but we want to focus on the uh, best use of your money or your budget when you are monitoring things in a drag racing application. Uh, so the first one I'd probably look at would be individual cylinder exhaust gas temperature. Now these are really important from a tuning standpoint anyway, once we're starting to really push an engine to its limits, uh, the room for error or the safe tuning envelope starts to get very, very narrow. We're going to see a cylinder to cylinder air distribution uh, difference on absolutely any engine, but of course when we're looking at a factory engine or one that's only moderately modified, the sort of air fuel ratio variation that we see as a result becomes 
almost irrelevant to some degree. But yeah, as we start leaning on things and getting right on the absolute limit, these small discrepancies can end up with one cylinder running lean enough to do damage. So really important to monitor that. Another really good one, particularly on high boost turbocharged engines, is to monitor the coolant pressure. Uh, from my own personal experience with our 4G63 drag program, basically we could make almost as much power as we wanted. The only factor that held us back was the head, cylind head to engine block uh, integrity, basically the head gasket sealing. So if you aren't aware that the head gasket is leaking, it can very quickly cause some significant damage. And by monitoring the, uh, the coolant pressure, it gives you an early warning that the head gasket is lifting or the head is lifting, that the combustion pressure is making its way into the coolant jacket. And this can let you get out of the throttle, abort a pass and uh, potentially prevent some quite costly damage to your engine. On top of that, there's the obvious as well, but I will mention them. We obviously want to be monitoring our air fuel ratio or lambda. We want to be monitoring our manifold pressure and we want to have safe bounds in, in uh, our strategy for a overboost cutout if our boost pressure gets out of control. And then of course RPM as well. Things are happening really quickly. These engines can pull RPM very, very fast and it's important to make sure that you have a rev limiter strategy in there that is going to protect your engine in the case that something allows the engine to over rev. Alright, so we've talked there about our engine protection strategies. What we're going to do now is talk about some of the uh, techniques that we can use to improve the performance of the car. Uh, that's obviously one of the key aspects. Once we know that the engine is reliable after the run, we want to look at what we can do in order to improve performance for the next run. And really when we've got a, a powerful car, uh, this is really a fine balancing act on managing the amount of torque that is put to the track from the start line through to the finish line. Uh, of course on a lower power car this probably is almost irrelevant once the car gets past the 60 foot line. If you've got a low power car you can basically put as much power to the track as the engine makes but uh, this becomes progressively harder once we make more and more power and I think a lot of uh, spectators sit back and think that drag racing is easy uh, but once you're starting to run in the 8 score faster it gets progressively more and more difficult and uh, it's a constant battle from day to day and even through Throughout the day the track changes dramatically, the weather conditions change, the amount of grip available on the track will change and we're constantly making subtle refinements to the calibration in the ECU to try and get the most out of the car and get the best possible results. Alright so one of the obvious uh, areas that we can do this is with our boost control strategy. So uh, how we control boost as the car goes down the track. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll just head across to my laptop screen for a moment. Uh, just make sure I'm looking at the right data here. Yeah, I am. Okay, so we're looking at some data here from uh, the Black Evo 9 that we've already looked at. So this is DS9. This is actually the record pass. So this is where it broke the world record. Uh, all of the data here is in I2, but of course you are going to be able to also uh, apply what we're going to talk about to just any system, doesn't have to be MoTeC. So at the top here we've got our engine RPM in red so we can see this is also using MoTeC's uh, drag racing uh, analysis strategy. So what we can see here is there are some vertical lines down through this log file. So the first one that I've just highlighted there, that is the start line, that's the start of the run. Uh, the next line here is the 60 foot mark and again I've sort of mentioned this but the 60 foot point is such a, a, a huge emphasis on improving our 60 foot time. So this allows us to see exactly what's going on. Uh, then we've got our 330 foot, well that's not a very good line. We've got our 330 foot mark here, uh, our 660, our 1000 foot and so on and so forth. So just allows, particularly when you're comparing uh, one run over another, it allows a very accurate uh, analysis so you can see exactly why one particular run was faster or where you gain time. 
Anyway, for this particular piece of data, all we want to focus on here is our manifold pressure, which we can see in blue. So here what we're doing is employing a gear-dependent boost strategy. Nothing particularly unique about this. We can use gear-dependent, or alternatively what we can do is use gear-dependent plus speed-dependent, or just speed-dependent on its own. The... The basis around this is obviously the uh, engine torque is being multiplied through the gear ratio that we're running in, so first, second, third or fourth in this particular case. And what we're trying to do is adjust the amount of boost pressure in each gear so that we're maximising the am amount of torque that can actually be put from the tyre to the ground. So what we find is that obviously as we go through the gears and that multiplication becomes less, we can produce more engine torque without the car wheel spinning. Uh, so what we can see here is that at right at the start line uh, we're running around about, I'm sorry for those who work in Imperial units, we are going to be talking in KPA here. Uh, so we're running around about uh, 250 KPA. Uh, so these are absolute numbers as well. So that's uh, 150 KPA of positive pressure. Uh, we then step up through first gear here. Uh, we end up running 324 kPa in second gear where we can feed in a little bit more boost, running 350 kPa. Uh, in third gear, 385 kPa and then finally the boost peaks our maximum value here, uh, 410 kPa or 310 kPa of positive boost pressure uh, before it tapers off a little bit higher in the run. So this is probably one of the main uh, levers that I had to pull from a tuning perspective when we were at the track is looking at how the car performed going down the track. Was it hooked up? If it was hooked up, could I feed in a little bit more boost pressure? And this was a really fine balancing act. Actually, what I'm doing at the moment is filtering that uh, RPM signal. So let's just get rid of that filtering and we can actually see on this run here uh, we've got a little blip in our RPM trace in third gear that shows that the car just lit up and wheel spun slightly and the racetrack that we're at uh, for this particular run there is a slight bump around about uh, half track and this is exactly what uh, the car hit and wheel spun. So what that shows me there is I'm right on the absolute edge there in terms of the amount of power that we could put down through third gear. Uh, what we could see as well is in fourth gear even we've got a little little blip right at this point so uh, again there's there's no real ability for me to put any more power to the track in third and fourth gear uh, if we come back down first gear uh, as we often see here is, is a bit of a mess we've got a, a shambles of sort of the car uh, sort of wheel spinning and clutch slipping to try and get off the line as well as it can second gear I probably could have just fed in slightly more boost pressure there now so that you've got some idea of what this all looks like, I'm going to again, uh, let me give, give, give me one second here, I'll just get my laptop set up. I'm going to show you a video of this particular car running. Um, and I'm going to apologise because this video is uh, from several years ago. Uh, our technology in terms of filming was nowhere near where it is right now. And uh, I think this is March 2010. So we're, we're eight odd years ago now. And uh, it does look like it's filmed on a potato. I assure you that it isn't. But uh, let's just head across to my laptop screen. Uh, we'll try and play this. I know it's not going to be perfect, so the guys are also going to drop into the comments or to the uh, notes later uh, the links for these videos so you can come and watch them at your leisure. So let's just watch this anyway and I'll try and narrate it. Right, so this we've got three angles of this of this shot as well. So this is filmed from the back of the car. Uh, car's on the launch control there. You see it bounces off the line and moves around, but for the rest of the run, it's actually pretty well hooked up. Uh, also, what we have seen there is that uh, it actually gets a little unsettled as it goes through second gear. Now this is the in-car. Uh, what you'll notice here is that the driver doesn't actually need to use the uh, gear lever. We'll talk about that in a second. So he's got a button on his steering wheel and uh, it's an air shifter through a sequential system. So all he needs to do is focus on controlling the car, which uh, is not that easy. You can see particularly in the shutdown area here, he's really struggling to get control over, over that car. And again, we've got another shot from the rear here just showing exactly 
exactly how much that moves around and again just how quickly everything happens there so uh, again you can re-watch this video we'll get those uh, into the links so that you into the comments so that you can watch now as I mentioned, it is all about managing that power delivery. So we'll just while we're on my laptop screen here, uh, we'll just show another shot of this uh, car. And this is what it looks like when you get it wrong. So this is feeding a little bit too much power into the car. Uh, I think as it transitioned into second gear, and uh, you'll see the effect of that. So again, it leaves the line pretty straight, hooks second gear, and well, actually it might have been third gear, and you see how much that moves around. So this is what we're trying to avoid, this is what we're always trying to balance. So what we'll do is we'll head across to our data and um, I'll just show you the data from that, oh, it might not actually be exactly that run but it's uh, another one where it's gotten loose and uh, this data was such a throwaway I didn't even bother turning it into a run uh, but we can see this particular section here is where the car is on the two step limiter building boost before the launch. Uh, there's not a lot of grip so what we can see is that as soon as the driver lets go of the clutch uh, it sits up on the rev limiter at 10,000 RPM so uh, it's just sitting there wheel spinning despite that the driver stays in full throttle. This green trace here is the throttle He's got out of the throttle at this point, the car's hooked up, he's pedaled the car a little bit, pedaled the throttle a little bit and got back into full throttle and uh, then it's ended up lighting up and wheel spinning again. So a uh, pretty ugly run and this is exactly what we want to try and avoid. Uh, the problem with the data when we're viewing this as well is that for a run that's this ugly, it can actually be quite hard to decide exactly what's happened, what's upset the car and uh, what caused of action to take. The reason for this is, and this is a quite easy to overlook, is that uh, the amount of power that we can put through the tyre uh, with a car that is well hooked up right from the start line compared to a car that ends up braking traction where the driver has to pedal out of the throttle and get back into it. Uh, it's very, very different. So if you have to get out of the throttle and get back into it, uh, affectionately known as pedaling the car, uh, then your run is basically a throwaway and you're going to often find that as you get back into the throttle and the car transitions back up, up onto boost, that in turn is going to then overpower the tyres again and you get into a situation where you're basically in and out of the throttle the whole way down the drag strip. Uh, so we've talked a little bit there about gear dependent and speed dependent boost. While I'm just talking about uh, pedalling the car there, another consideration we may want to make is including some throttle position based control of the boost as well. This is really common in circuit racing, less so in drag racing. Now the problem with a turbocharged car is that the uh, power delivery versus throttle position is incredibly non-linear and what this means is essentially the engine will be probably making uh, up to 80 or 90 percent of peak power even when the driver is backed off all the way to maybe 50 percent throttle or even a little bit less so it makes it very hard for the driver to control the power with the throttle. Uh, so by tailoring the, tapering the boost off as the driver rolls out of the throttle, this can really help uh, the driver control a car that is a little bit loose or right on the limit. Of course, as soon as you've rolled out of the throttle, uh, your your time is, is probably not going to really count for much. But uh, as drag racers, we're always trying to beat the person in the other lane. So this can be the difference between a win or a loss. All right, so we've talked about our boost control here, but I want to just show you uh, what that actually looks like in our ECU. So let's head across to my laptop screen. Again, I'm using MoTeC here. The two cars that I'm using for our examples both used MoTeC but uh, again, you can really relate this to uh, just about any ECU. Uh, so let's head into our boost control. And uh, what we want to do is have a look at our aim boost. So this is what is quite a, a simple strategy here. We've got a three-dimensional table, which is just relative to boost pressure, uh, sorry, relative to our gear. Uh, this is a four-speed gearbox again in this particular car. Uh, so we've got the, the gear on the vertical axis, we've got our engine RPM on the horizontal axis and the numbers in this table are simply duty cycle being fed to the wastegate. 
So this is a personal preference with mine. I wouldn't say that I would still apply this in absolutely every application, but my personal preference is actually to run open loop boost control in a very high powered drag car. Now there's a couple of reasons that I do this. Uh, as anyone who has tried to tune closed loop boost control before would probably be aware, it is incredibly finicky. You have to get your PID gains very, very finely tuned to get good control. And in a street application or a lower powered application, it's probably not that big a deal if our boost varies by maybe one and a half or two PSI while we're trying to get on top of that. Uh, if we're running 60, 70, 80 or 100 PSI of boost pressure, we want to be pretty damn sure that our boost is exactly on our target. If we go over by a couple of PSI, uh, that could end up damaging our engine. So. Uh, for this reason, oh, the, other, the other aspect there is that our boost is going to vary based on our atmospheric conditions day to day uh, or even during the day as those conditions change with heat and atmospheric pressure. So for this reason I prefer open loop, I may be on my own here but I prefer open loop. What I'm doing again is looking at that data after I run down the strip and because I'm looking at gear versus RPM, it makes it really easy if for example I see at uh, 9,500 RPM in third gear, uh, I can take a little bit more boost. I can go to, well that's actually 10,500 RPM, let's come back here. I can go to exactly that site and I can feed in a little bit more duty cycle into that table and uh, I can chip away at that as we go through the day of drag racing and get my boost control exactly where I want it. So uh, that's why I personally prefer to use open loop. Now I just want to head back to our data for a second here and what we're going to do is also this really comes back to uh, the engine protection side of things. I, I haven't mentioned this yet but we'll come back to our world record holding uh, data or run here and at the bottom in red we've got our lambda, our air fuel ratio or lambda value and we can see that for the most part this is tracking around about 0.82 lambda which uh, we're sort of aiming somewhere between 0 0.80 and 0 0.82 in this particular application. What we can see though is once we get past the 1000 foot mark it is quite subtle uh, but we see the lambda start to lean out a little bit. First of all heads to 0.83 and then uh, just before the driver backs off going across the finish line uh, we get up to 0.841. Uh, fortunately it didn't do any damage but that is definitely leaner than I'd like to be running at uh, sort of close to 300 kPa of positive boost pressure. Now the reason for this, I've got this data up on the screen as well and this is just a really good indication of like why you need to be looking at all of the data and trying to understand what it shows you is if we look at our purple trace here which is our fuel pressure we can see that for the most part our fuel pressure is stepping up as we go down the drag strip and as we increase our boost so essentially our differential pressure is remaining the same until we get to the thousand foot mark and you can see our fuel pressure takes a dive here and the reason for this is uh, we were right on the limit of the entire fuel system here and uh, basically this is why we couldn't push any further with that car. The fuel system and the fuel pumps really couldn't cope and we see that that fuel pressure drops off and uh, this particular ECU, uh, the way it was set up wasn't accounting for fuel pressure so that's why we see our Lambda uh, start to move a little bit leaner than we'd like to see. And if we're looking at our EGTs which is our bottom trace here, we've got our EGTs all measuring in uh, degrees centigrade, we see that our EGTs also start to take uh, a uphill angle after that lean out as well. So uh, if the drag strip was a little bit longer, probably would have been picking up some broken engine components off the track. So uh, something we we're probably quite lucky to get away with there. Alright so what we'll also look at here is uh, our launch strategy so this is all about getting our maximum boost to the track or a maximum power to the track and with a turbocharged car this is also a fine balancing act because we also want to be able to uh, get as much boost as we can with these big turbochargers they are laggy they take a lot of time to respond and uh, for this reason we want to often try and run more boost 
particularly through first gear than maybe the engine can handle. So I'll show you a couple of ways, uh, sorry, more than the track can take, not that the engine can handle. So we'll show you a couple of uh, aspects there. So first of all, looking at our data again, uh, we can see this area of our data log, which is before the car has launched. And this is where the driver is on the two-step launch control. So we look at our RPM here and we can see that that's sitting nice and consistent there, bouncing it around at about 72.50 RPM. And what we can see is that during this period, our ignition timing is retarded beyond TDC. So our timing is four degrees after TDC at this point. So we're actually igniting the fuel air charge after the piston has gone past TDC. Now this is incredibly effective at both building exhaust gas temperature as well as building boost pressure. So we can see in our boost trace here that what this has resulted in, while it does move around a little bit, we're sitting at around about 240 kPa, around about 20 psi of boost pressure. And then as soon as the driver leaves the line, the ignition timing reverts at this point to our table values. In this case, we've got 28 degrees. All right, so we're using that launch control strategy, our two-step to uh, help get the turbo up on boost. Now, with a 2.2-litre engine with a Garrett GT42 turbo, there's absolutely no way uh, we'd be able to get enough boost just on a secondary rev limit. We need to retard the timing uh, to help build that boost. What we're doing is creating uh, the combustion event happening later in the engine cycle out into the exhaust manifold. That's creating enough exhaust gas energy to spool that turbo. Let's have a look and see what that looks like inside our tuning software. Uh, so what we're using here, there is a two-step or dual RPM function here. So this is on a digital input that is run off a clutch switch here. So if we look at this, or we look at our parameters, there's a couple of things we want to take into account here. Uh, so first of all, we've got our low RPM limit. This is simply our launch control limit and we can see that set to 7200. So this is another one of those uh, levers that we've got to adjust or pull when we're at the track tuning this car. Uh, depending on the amount of grip on the start line, we can increase or reduce our uh, RPM for our two-step limiter. The next one we've got there is our RPM rise rate. You can see that's set to 5000. Now, I'm going to get into exactly how that works shortly, but for now let's just park that. We'll just basically state that all that does is it limits how quickly the RPM can rise when that limiter is turned off. It's quite important as we'll see. And then we've got our ignition retard. Now we can see that in this case I'm not actually using that function there. I've got that ignition retard set to zero. The reason that I don't use the ignition retard in this particular function is that it's fixed. We're retarding the timing by a fixed amount and uh, in my own opinion that's not particularly useful. Uh, so what I'm doing instead is I'm retarding the timing in another way. First of all, we've got our main ignition table over here on the right hand side. We've got the numerical numbers in the table here and we've got a range of compensations uh, in inside the ignition setup. We'll go to comp one and this is a compensation that I have set up based on whether or not the clutch switch is active. So at the top there we've got two step on or off, zero or one. Uh, so we can see that our comp when the clutch switch is off, obviously zero, it's not doing anything. And I've set up manifold pressure as the load axis for this table. So what I'm doing here is I'm adjusting the amount of retard based on the boost pressure that I'm achieving. So what we can do is we can start when the engine is still in slight amount of vacuum with only 10 degrees out. This means that when we activate the two-step limit, uh, if we're just sitting there at idle, the engine isn't going to stall. We're not actually going to pull any timing at idle. But once we go to full throttle and we get up to 9,500 kPa, that's when we start pulling timing. And then we can see we're quite aggressive here. This actually isn't a great table to show it. I'm pulling about 32 degrees to get the effect that I want. But what we can see here is once we go past 250 kPa, which is is my target boost, I'm actually reducing that retard. So we're adding the timing back in. We go from 32 degrees of retard back to 28 degrees. So what we can do by using the numbers in this table and manipulating them, we can get some sort of level of control over our boost pressure in order to get the, the boost that we want. 
quite a common scenario we see with people using uh, this sort of ignition retard boost control is the boost kind of starts building and building and building and then it kind of becomes self-sustaining and we actually see the boost rise out of control. We don't want that. We want to be able to leave the line every time with the same boost pressure so that the engine is making the same power so that all of our strategies for our launch control are the same uh, time after time. Now we'll also show you as well in our aim boost another aspect that we've got to work with for our launch control is we can see that in gear position zero we still have a wastegate duty cycle value. You can see I've got that set to 24%. So we can basically adjust the boost pressure or the amount of control on the wastegate so that's another aspect that we can use to control that boost pressure on the start line. Alright so I've mentioned there I'll just head back to the data logging. I've mentioned that we're trying to use more boost pressure than the engine can really, or the car can put to the track normally, and particularly through second gear here. The reason we're trying to do this is because if we had to run a little bit less boost in second gear just to keep the car hooked up, what that would mean is that when we hook third gear, we can now increase the boost. It's going to take a lot longer for that boost pressure to roll up to where we want it to be. And we can see, even with flat shifting here, there is quite a little, quite an amount of time that it takes for that turbo to spool up. Big old lazy turbocharger on a relatively small engine. So what we want to do here to reduce particularly this gap here as much as we can is we want, want to run more boost pressure in second gear than we could probably get to the ground under normal circumstances. So this again comes down to torque management. Uh, if we're making a certain amount of boost pressure and we want to reduce the torque, one of the tools we have uh, at our disposal there is to adjust our ignition timing. And I've got our ignition timing being displayed here, let's just move this graph up so we can see what's happening. Now it does look like it's all over the place here. Uh, we've got our ignition timing here through first gear where we're not really making too much boost sitting let's say at about 27 degrees. What you can see uh, also I'll mention there on each of the gear shifts we've got uh, an ignition retard event just to help smooth the torque reintroduction uh, to help settle the car on the gear shift so we can see uh, that's our first to second shift then we've got the same on our second to third shift and then third to fourth. What we're looking at though is this particular section here where the car is in second gear and what we can see is that the timing has actually been retarded so we're only running about 11 to 12 degrees through there uh, despite the fact we've got 350 kPa uh, boost pressure. So this is another trick that we've got at, is, at our disposal is tuning or trimming the timing based on either gear or based on time. So let's have a quick look back in our tuning software. We'll see how exactly I've done that. In this case it was relatively simple. I'll show you a more advanced one in a second. We'll go down to our ignition compensations and what we want to do is look at gear comp. We can see we've got a two dimensional table here. Uh, ignition trim versus gear and all you can see here is I'm pulling eight degrees out when the car is in second gear. So it just allows me to run that little bit more boost we're trimming the torque using our ignition timing and then the advantage with this is that when we feed that timing back in in third gear we've already got a lot more boost there than we would have otherwise had so it just reduces the uh, lag that we're going to see as we spool that turbo back in, uh, into third gear. Alright so what I'm going to do is show you a slightly more advanced version of that strategy. So let's head across and we'll show you, this is another car that I was involved with, I mentioned before the heat treatments in the San R32 GTR. Uh, this was, I'm pretty sure this was actually the first time we broke the four wheel drive world record uh, in pre-testing for the Jamboree over in Australia at Willowbank Raceway, so this was private testing. Uh, we'll just quickly show this one pass so that's just the burnout warming the tyres up uh, and then we'll have a look at some data and see exactly what I was doing to try and manage the torque. 
So you can see at that point there, a little little uh, puff of smoke had actually did a wheel spin slightly and hopefully you'd have been able to see that uh, the car was quite loose going down the strip there. Again, if you want to have a better look at this video, uh, we'll make sure that's available afterwards as well. Alright, so what we'll do is we'll head back across to my laptop tuning software and we'll have a quick look at what I'm doing with the heat treatments car. So there's two functions here. First of all, in second gear, I'm doing exactly the same thing that we saw with the Evo. Second gear, we're pulling four degrees timing out. However, what I've also done with the heat treatments car, uh, we'll just have a quick look at this one first. I've set up a timer based on the two-step switch. So uh, this timer starts when the two-step switch is uh, released and it will reset when that switch is reactivated. So the two-step switch is just at the base of the clutch. So we can see that the x-axis for this timer is as you'd expect, time. And what we've got here is a ignition retard based on time from the start line. So we can see one second into the run, uh, which is just before the 60 foot, I start pulling a little bit of ignition timing. We've got one degree, two degrees, three degrees, and then finally at 1.75 seconds through to 2.25 seconds, we're pulling four degrees. Now that's going to work in conjunction with that gear-based timer, uh, gear-based trim as well. Uh, so we at some points are pulling up to eight degrees of timing out of the engine there. So this allows just a little bit more sophistication and a little bit more control of your torque management compared to if we were just solely going to uh, going to use a gear-based trim. And what we'll do is we'll also have a quick look at the data from that particular car. Uh, with the heat treatments car, this uses a proper drag racing gearbox. This is a uh, Liberty air-shifted five-speed clutchless box, uh, only useful for drag racing. Basically what it allows is complete uh, seamless upshifts, no, no requirement for any torque reduction, so it's not like a conventional circuit racing sequential dog box where you need a, uh, a torque reduction from the ECU to allow the shift to complete, uh, basically completely seamless. So uh, what we can see here as well is our boost pressure control. Uh, so with this particular car we are still stepping the boost up uh, as we go down the strip but there is a big difference with this particular car, uh, not something that's going to be too relevant to uh, most import drag races, but as we start getting more and more serious, what we find is that with these manual transmission cars, I uh, tend to run what is referred to as a slider clutch or a slipper clutch, and this is a special clutch designed for drag racing, and it has an adjustment for ba both the base amount of pressure that will be applied to the clutch plates, as well as some centrifugal weight that can be applied which make the clutch lock up either more or less as the engine RPM increases. And these become, this is beyond the scope of our talk today and it's not an engine tuning aspect but with these slider style clutches or slipper clutches it's really important to give the clutch a, a really consistent amount of power. If we change the power through the ECU then it's going to have a dramatic effect on the, the way the clutch locks up and uh, that can really skew our data completely. Alright, so uh, we've talked about uh, our boost control, I just want to also show you the last example that I had wasn't that great, if we jump back into the laptop software, we'll just look at the two step setup on the heat treatments car because this is a better example of what I was trying to explain. We've got exactly the same setup for our two step uh, ignition retard. We can see that we're really aggressive here right up to uh, around about 340 kPa. We're pulling 38 degrees of timing from the main timing map and then once we get up to that point uh, at 350 kPa we're only pulling 28 degrees and then if we go above this you can see we're only pulling 15 degrees. So what we end up with is a situation where uh, the boost sort of ends up fluctuating around about that 340-350 kPa as it goes up the ignition is added back in so we don't get as much exhaust gas energy to spool the turbo so the boost tends to drop away so uh, it's quite a good way of getting a reasonably good amount of control uh, over the 
the uh, boost pressure on the start line and again as I've sort of mentioned it's really important to get that consistent if you want to get good consistent results with your launches. If your boost pressure is different from one run to another uh, you're never going to be able to decide on exactly what the reason was for the car going well. Was it uh, the RPM that you left the line at or was it the, the fact that the boost pressure was different? Alright, we're going to move into some questions really shortly, so if you do have anything uh, related to this, please uh, feel free to ask those questions in the comments. Now, uh, what I want to do though is just show you one more video here, again we'll make this available. So this is from uh, the same heat treatments car, and this is just a, another indication of when you've gone too far and you've overpowered the track. So we'll just watch what happens here and then I'll talk you through it. Alright, so obviously a, a pretty wild ride and uh, in, in hindsight uh, Reese probably would have been better to have bought that run and uh, call it a bad day at the office and get out of the throttle but uh, for some reason he decided to uh, persevere and stick with it. He got to the end of the strip without hitting the wall uh, but it was a pretty fine thing. Uh, what we can see though, and we'll just go back to the start of the run here, uh, basically, and this is quite common with drag racing, We'll just go back to the point where the car actually launches. Uh, this is this is it's so important to get the car to hook up from the moment it leaves the line, and this is easy to overlook. If the car is loose from the time it leaves the line, then the rest of the pass you're going to be basically playing catch up, and it's again what I was talking about earlier: the situation where uh, if you overpower the tyres and you have to pedal on the throttle, uh, when you get back into the throttle and the boost comes back on, you're likely to over power the tyres again. So we'll just watch as the car leaves the line and you see that it bounces in the rear. So as soon as it sets up that bouncing in the rear it's unsettled and it's unloading the rear tyres and as soon as it's unloading the rear tyres basically the rest of the run is just an abortion. And this particular point here where the car turns hard right, uh, this is on one of the gear shifts. So again, this is a, an important aspect with uh, a manual gearbox. This is why we're now seeing a lot of the faster cars uh, move to automatic transmissions which are much smoother on the gear shift. With a manual transmission we see uh, quite a sharp change on the gear shift and this is often enough to unsettle the car and uh, cause the tyres to break traction. So that's exactly what happens there and the rest is history. So what I want to do is show you uh, another technique that we can use there and what I'll do is I'll start actually let's head back I did say that I'd talk about this photo in a little bit more detail so this is one of the products that we created uh, through my old shop Speedtech Motorsport and uh, this was kind of a product that we created out of necessity uh, more than anything else uh, we actually ended up creating it and selling it as a product all around the world which uh, blew us all away because it's incredibly niche so this only worked for the Evo 4 to 9 uh, you needed a drag racing or a uh, sequential, sorry, you needed a dog engagement motorsport style gearbox and then the lever mechanism that you can see in here, this was an IKEA uh, shifter, so uh, IKEA is a Japanese product, it basically converts the H pattern gearbox into sequential. So what we did was we made this aluminium base that you can see here, uh, bolted underneath the IKEA shifter and it used an air ram which we can see here and basically then it turned the whole system into a uh, air shifted gearbox. Now the reason we created this was the Black Evo 9 Project DS9 that I've talked about. Uh, the owner of that car uh, basically jumped right on the deep end with this project. The fastest he'd ever gone on the quarter prior to us building this car for him was uh, I think about a 12.5 or a 13.5 so uh, we've gone straight from that point to a car that was capable of running initially at least in the mid nines. He had quite a bit of trouble with that which uh, probably comes as no big surprise and uh, when we were testing the car I jumped in it, did a couple of passes down the strip and made sure everything was fine, it was shifting great 
he jumped in it and uh, really couldn't get his head around the clutchless shifting with the sequential. It always had the sequential lever in it, it had a strain gauge on it and all he had to do was leave the line, drop the clutch and from there just pull back on the lever when the shift light came on, didn't need to back off the throttle, didn't need, need to use the clutch. He really struggled with that to the point where uh, at a couple of times he hung it up on the 10,500 RPM rev limiter for an extended period of time and uh, that's not real good for these engines so he did a bit of damage as a result. So we developed this air shifter so basically it's just like playing PlayStation there is a button on the steering wheel all he had to do was press that that sent a signal to the MoTeC ECU to provide a gear change ignition cut so it momentarily cut uh, ignition to allow the dogs to un, un uh, load and the gear change to take place. It then uh, also sent a signal to a solenoid that powered up that air shifter which then moved the gear lever. So it all became really seamless as soon as we did that. Uh, the car was incredibly reliable uh, and, and just went faster and faster. So I'll just show you how we're using that strategy though. Uh, we'll just jump into the data again and we'll have a quick look at the world record pass. And what we can see is, I've already mentioned it, but on the shifts we are using uh, ignition cut but also we're using ignition retard. And the reason we're using that retard is with the ignition cut it's only momentary, somewhere in the region of maybe uh, 50 to 80 milliseconds and when the ignition is reintroduced uh, obviously all of the power comes back on and that can be enough to unload the tyres and cause wheel spin. Uh, so what we're seeing here is, although it's very brief, uh, we'll play around with this quite a bit depending on the particular car. What we can do is create some ignition retard and then ramp the ignition timing back in to smooth the reintroduction of torque there. Uh, so that makes a really big difference when you're walking on the tightrope with a tyre that do doesn't really have uh, enough grip for what you're trying to do. Alright, the very last thing I'm going to talk about here is probably the worst kept secret in drag racing circles and uh, that is the clutch slipper. Uh, I'd like to think that I actually came up with this by myself but uh, chances are uh, there were a bunch of people who were also developing this at the same time as me. Uh, anyway, it was something that was really, really popular uh, for, and it still is popular with a lot of drag cars. Uh, now, just while I've been talking here, this is uh, a really bad uh, way of doing it, but let's just jump across to my laptop screen. Uh, this is one of the commercial products that now is available from Magnus Motorsport, and we can see this here. What it consists of is uh, a little solenoid which controls the fluid flow for your clutch system and then we've got this little valve here uh, that basically acts as an adjustable restrictor in the clutch line. So with that out of the way, what it essentially allows us to do is control how quickly or slowly the clutch is released. So the idea behind this is that the driver can sidestep the clutch and instead of the clutch just banging straight up and engaging fully, often this will either in involve the car bogging in quite hard or uh, maybe lighting up and wheel spinning. Uh, what it does is it controls and smoothly releases the clutch so it creates a controllable, consistent and repeatable amount of clutch slip through first gear and that is absolutely critical in getting fast consistent standing starts in a drag car, even more critical when you've got four big sticky slicks on a four wheel drive drag car and uh, with the black Evo 9 that we've been looking at there, uh, the fastest 60 foot that ever did was a 1.260. Now I think if my memory serves me correctly, while well, we've now got a few Evo late model Evos that are now running in the high 7 area, uh, the 60 foot we got with that car still is just about as good as any of those cars so we really put in a lot of effort making sure that the 60 foot was as good as we could get. So the idea there is we slip the clutch so that the car is not wheel spinning, the tyres stay hooked up but we don't end up with the engine bogging so it's all about trying to smoothly transition from you know standing start where our RPM should essentially be zero if the clutch was engaged and the wheels aren't spinning, uh, aren't turning to the point where we're at the end of first gear and the RPM and the wheel speed are in sync and the clutch is fully locked up. Uh, a lot can be 
gained if we get that right. But there are some problems around that which is the result of the engine RPM initially being able to flare quite dramatically. So let's head back to my laptop screen again and we'll see what that kind of looks like. So this again is that, that world record pass and we can see this is the point here where the clutch has actually started to, or the, the driver has let go of the launch control and the clutch has started to move off the floor. We see the RPM rise but the clutch actually hasn't started to bite so the car actually isn't moving. So this is the problem with that system and we need to control that and that is where I'm using the RPM rise rate. Let's just go back to our oh, dual RPM. Uh, this is actually for the heat treatments car but anyway we saw the RPM rise rate I had in the Evo 9 was set to 5000 RPM per second. So basically what this means is that when we come off the two step uh, if the clutch if the clutch plates don't immediately start to grab, the RPM isn't going to zing straight up to our rev limiter. What it's going to do, the ECU is going to control that RPM rise rate. And uh, it's really what we want to try and do of course is, is uh, get the point where the clutch switch disengages and the clutch plates start to engage synchronised but that's not always absolutely perfect and we don't always get that absolutely right. So there in a nutshell is probably some of the key things that I've learned over a career of about 18 years now, uh, particularly in the import drag racing industry. Uh, again, probably for a lot of people who are competing actively in drag racing, nothing I've talked about here is really too much magic. There really isn't any magic in this, but it's a case of looking at the tools available to us through our ECU and our tuning and deciding how we can manipulate those tools, which ones we can use in order to achieve the best possible outcome. And all of this really comes down to sometimes thinking a little bit outside of the box uh, gets us the best possible result. I will just mention before we move into questions that if you are considering using a clutch slipper uh, be aware that you are going to end up burning through some clutch plates. We obviously are purposely slipping the clutch uh, in my own drag car using a triple plate Tilton or triple plate Quartermaster I should say clutch uh, we would be throwing out that clutch after about 10 passes down the strip the clutch plates would just be completely rinsed, complete throw away so uh, that's a cost you definitely need to factor in. Uh, also as an upside though uh, because the shock loading on the launch is reduced this is also a lot easier on your drivetrain components. Alright our first question comes from Matt who's asked uh, at a rough guess how much would the entire STM EVO 3 drag program cost including everything? <sighs> Matt, I never added it up. Uh, I don't want to know. Uh, what I can tell you is that at that point in my career, every single spare cent was being poured into my drag racing. Uh, I didn't have much of a social life uh, and I wasn't doing anything outside of drag racing. It is uh, a very expensive occupation if you want to be doing it at that level. We're also very lucky to have a number of people backing us in terms of our sponsors who were making it possible for us to do what we're doing. Uh, so yeah, I, I really don't know what it cost us in total. The other thing, which is pretty common that you need to factor in, is that the car wasn't built from a bare shell into what you saw uh, the photo I showed you right at the start of today's webinar. Uh, this was an, an iteration, an iterative build that sort of uh, grew and changed over the course of about four or five years of drag racing. So that did sort of uh, make the, the hit a little bit easier to stomach but there was still a huge amount of money uh, that went into, into that car. Uh, if you wanted to start start from scratch and build a car to that level, I, I would say you would probably need to be budgeting somewhere around about 150 to 200,000 US dollars. Um, I'm talking here if you wanted to take a late model Evo and beat what is now a 7.7 uh, world record, you're probably going to be needing to play in, in that sort of sandpit. 
Uh, Daniel Hoy has asked what fuel are you using for a 0.5 Lambda on the heat treatments car uh, so that run on methanol fuel so uh, yeah they run very very rich on methanol fuel it's not uncommon to be running in the range of uh, 0.6 uh, maybe 0.55 to 0.65 uh, very dependent on the particular engine you're tuning and also the boost level uh, from my recollection with that car we, we ran it generally uh, just slightly richer than about 0.60. Uh, Craig has asked, would using a, a DCT dual clutch transmission change the overboost setup in the lower gears? Uh, haven't really played around with uh, too many dual clutch transmissions uh, at that sort of power level. What we find is that most uh, factory dual clutch transmissions sort of uh, don't tend to take uh, five or four or five times more more than factory power output that well. So uh, generally, we're sort of switching to an aftermarket transmission at that power level. I guess the exception to that rule would be the R35 GTR. Uh, what we find with a well set up dual clutch transmission is that the shift speed is incredibly fast, faster than what we saw with the sequentially shifted or air shifted uh, manual box. But um, I think you're still going to have exactly the same sort of uh, problem that we encountered as well. Uh, obviously the faster you can get that shift the less time the engine is, or the less time the engine's torque is reduced for, uh, so you won't see the boost pressure drop off quite to the magnitude we saw uh, on the data log file from that DS9 car, so that's another point I should make there. Uh, Craig's also asked, I'm not sure how, how fast the air shifter shifts. Uh, the shift time was dependent on the gear shift, so uh, this wasn't a closed loop system which we had used these days where it was physically monitoring the gear position and only cutting for the amount of time required uh, all it was doing was providing a timed cut and uh, particularly with that IKEA shifter on the second to third shift uh, in the H pattern box that's in a cross gate shift which is quite slow and time consuming so uh, I, I think the shift time was somewhere around about uh, maybe 90 or 100 milliseconds for that second to third shift and we we're down around 60 milliseconds for the other shifts. Uh, Daniel has also asked uh, on the percent by gear chart you mentioned a four speed trans is the zero uh, in the chart used for the trans brake so uh, no so zero in this case is just the neutral pos position so uh, because this is a manual transmission not an auto there is actually no trans brake uh, but because we but we've got that zero or neutral position uh, in the table that allows us to set the wastegate duty cycle when the car's on the two step on the launch control and that's just one more of those aspects we can adjust between that RPM and ignition retard to get the boost pressure that we want on the start line. All right, guys, that has taken us to the end of our webinar. Uh, a bit of a long one there, so hopefully uh, everyone's still awake and enjoyed that lesson, uh, enjoyed that webinar. As usual, for our HPA members, if you do have any more questions related to this topic, please ask them in the forum, and I'll be happy to answer them there. All right, guys, thanks heaps for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you all next time. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.